Hey, Vsauce, Michael here. Where are your fingers? This video is brought to you by who? You're goddamn right, it's the legends over at Squarespace, who I actually- Oh, this script is already so damaged. Who I super appreciate, because Squarespace have been a loyal, super loyal sponsor of this channel since, like, the early days, when it was, like, really Squarespace. <laughs> this channel and then they keep coming back because apparently you legends get the Squarespace through my link which is amazing and I appreciate Squarespace I appreciate you allowing this channel to proceed and happen so uh yeah I haven't hit any of the talking points there but Squarespace is a place where you can make a website super easily uh, I made my own website there it's uh it's just fantastic so let's just move on and I'll tell you a bit more about them in a bit this video is uh, all about more inventions we're all disappointed we don't have yet weird dreams and smell vision oh my god I need to take a breath <gasps> Woo! that was a long title Danny probably a omen of a very long introduction what happens here if you're new you're probably not uh Danny writes me a script I shall read the script Sam afterwards is gonna mix in some of the finest vintage memes Let's do it. It's been well over a year since Business Blaze last took a look at some of the incredible futuristic inventions we still haven't materialized yet, even though we've been promised them decades ago. Is something like a baby's teething toy or it's a ring? I don't know what it is, but it's... Oh my god, there's so many inventions out. Flying cars would be great. Uh, what else? Replicators would be great. Transporters would be... These are like wildly impossible Star Trek inventions that are just not gonna happen in the near future. Like replicators. Transporters, I mean what, we're gonna like get ourselves transformed into like a beam of energy. Ah. Please. In fact, it's been so long ago that I've forgotten what we talked about. I had to boot up the turbocharged memory trip I'd implanted in my brain a few years back to get an instant download of the information I needed. Sounds like daddy got those inventions we all want. Elon, come on! Where's my brain chip, Elon? Hurry the fuck up! Daddy, chill. Stop working on your stupid electric cars and start turning my brain into a machine. That is what he's doing, right? Or have I misinterpreted the neural link thing? Except of course I didn't, because then I remembered that such a memory chip that hasn't been rolled out to the general public. We might not- <laughs> Danny, I don't think there's people in private with magical memory chips. We might not be- <laughs> Conspiracy theories be like, oh, see ya. <laughs> Simon. <laughs> such a small brain, the CIA's been doing it for years! <laughs> we might not be hundreds of years away from a similar concept, though, over the last few years. The US Department's uh, Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency- Danny, let's just call it DARPA, it's so much easier. <laughs> Uh, has plowed over $77 million into the development of a new surgically implanted chip which can apparently improve your memory by up to 37%. How have I not heard of that? $77 million is also not a lot of money for DARPA projects. I've got a channel called Mega Projects where we talk about things that DARPA makes often and it's like, oh my f***ing god. How many billions? How many hundreds of billions? Well, my money. Jesus! Bring a little stupid ass on. The initial intention is to help restore the memory capacity of people suffering from traumatic brain injuries, but it could potentially evolve into an optional human memory upgrade. Yeah, I'll take that 37%. All you're gonna do is put a chip in my brain? Bring it on! I suppose that not everyone will be happy with the idea of having a microchip surgically implanted in their brain. Yeah, well, those people will be left behind, won't they? This is the problem with all of this sort of invention sh it's like, look, you're going to have to use it because other people are going to be using it. And then you're going to go to a job interview and they'll be like, well, should we take the guy with the chip in the brain? Or should we take the dumb dumb who's only got like the flesh brain? <laughs> and in the future, we'll like, be calling people, you know, small brain. You'll be like, ah, flesh brain. Ah, how many chips do you have? Zero. I've got 17. Uh, I mean, so you'll have to do it because otherwise you'll just be like someone who can't use a computer. They'll be like, no, no, I, I don't type. <laughs> I don't know how to send emails. It's like, okay, well, you're relegated to, like, manual labor or something from now on because, like, any profession, you need that, don't you? Don't you? The initial intention is to help restore the memory capacity of people suffering from traumatic... Oh, we already read that. <laughs> I need my memory upgrade, don't I? Ah! I suppose that not everyone will be happy with the idea of having a micro... Did I already read that as well? F***ing hell whistle. Get your sh together. But those cynics will just have to put up with spending the rest of their lives forgetting to put out the bins on time, struggling to remember their online banking passwords. Oh my god, <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> so I don't I don't remember any of my passwords uh, because of course I use password manager. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I do, that doesn't help me with putting that. I didn't have to put the bins out. The bin men come in and they collect my bins. I, I don't know. <laughs> but there's other need to remember. Like a, lot of, a few times I've just arrived in my office and it's like, oh yeah, you know what I need to get into my office? Keys. So I put my keys in a little lock, bo lock box outside my house. 
uh, but only one key, and then I hid the other key inside. So like, I had the key to the building in the lockbox, and then the key to my offices, my office hidden in like another area inside the building. Um, <laughs> but then someone broke into my lockbox and stole my key. And I was like, you dick, what are you gonna do with that? <laughs> like, why? 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 Do you think I'm smart? What was I talking about? Oh yeah, so I forgot, I think used to forget my keys. Um, so then I made a little checklist that I go through when I leave the house because I don't have a memory chip yet. Dreaming. Uh, I'm wondering why exactly they wandered into the kitchen. But anyway, after going back and watching the original video again, it turns out that we covered things like hoverboards, teleports, jetpacks, and food and tiny pills. But there are so- oh my god, that was such a long time ago, I remember. But there are so many more prematurely promised products that appear to be inexplicably delayed, much to the disappointment of the human race. So what's the bloody hold up, science? Fuck you, science! Yeah, I mean, I don't think we need to blame science. I think it's pretty clear that Elon Musk is to blame for this delay. Because he's bringing us all this other- so, Elon, no, I'm not going to Mars. Fuck it. It's like a nasty desert with no air. Don't want to go there. Send some robots. I don't know, I'd rather live in space, to be honest. Like, the whole thing about, yeah, let's get to Mars so we can, like, live on Mars. It's like, that's not horrible. I'd rather live on a space station. Like, if the worry is that Earth's gonna get destroyed, or whatever, from, like, nuclear holocaust, why not just build a massive space station? And then at least we can, like, go up and down, like, while the Earth hasn't been destroyed. I don't know, there's no gravity. But also, there's, like, one, one quarter gravity, one sixth gravity on Mars? I'm sure that's gonna f*** up as well. Can't we just do one of those giant spinning things? No, we're well off track here. But let's just get focused on the chips in the brains and building a giant space station, okay? Okay, Elon? I hope you're watching. I've seen you on PewDiePie's channel, so I know you watch all of YouTube. I'm watching. Get on that giant space station, Elon. <laughs> The dream machine! Imagine you're flicking through the TV planner with a bottle of wine and a bowl of magic spoon. Danny, I, I don't think ma I like I like magic spoon, but I don't think it really goes with wine. <laughs> you could plump for something like the extended versions of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Ugh, we've seen those hundreds of ugh, times already. And you fancy something a bit meatier with a longer running time. Doesn't the Lord of the Rings extended trilogy dumpster fire of a shit show last like 12 hours? I could imagine nothing less interesting. If someone was like, do you want to s actually, do you want to sit in a chair and do nothing and just be left alone with your own thoughts? Or would you rather spend 12 hours watching Lord of the Rings? I would actually not jokingly choose to just sit in the chair. Jokes on you, I'm into that shit. Then you spot it in the planner. Last night's dream. That should be quite fun, as you got you got a very vague memory that someone had to do something with challenging with David Hasselhoff to a boxing match on top of the Sydney Opera House as the entire cast of Little House on the Prairie cheered you on in the crowds below. Your dreams are a lot more interesting than mine, Danny. I had a dream the other day that I found a desert eagle, like a, one of those big ass guns in my house, and then I kept accidentally setting it off because it had like a really sensitive trigger, and I was like, I'm not even pressing the trigger and it keeps going off. So what is wrong with my dreams? <laughs> It's very boring. <laughs> I don't know why I'm telling you this story. Apparently we only- People have been like, Simon, I'm a dream interpreter. Watch out, because that's gonna mean like an omen in your future about guns. You're gonna get shot. And I'll be like, shut up. Your whole thing about dream interpretation is built based on a lie. It's not real. Please stop it and find something useful to do with your life. You loser. Stop it. Get some help. Apparently, we only vividly remember about 10% of our dreams that we had, while the other 90% is reduced to distant echoes and slippery sensations that we can't really quite resemble again properly in our heads. And we're still not entirely sure why we even bother to dream at all, although some think dre dreaming to deeply buried anxieties or prophecies of the future for the activation synthesis hypothesis proposes. The activation synthesis hypothesis. Oh, f hell, Danny. Do you have to use so many big boy words? <laughs> it's really hard for me. Would you tell Picasso to sell his guitars? proposes that a typical dream is nothing more than our brains attempting to make sense of the completely random and meaningless electrical impulses which are getting fired about all over the place as we drift into REM sleep. Yes, yes. There's nothing magical about dreams. They're not you, like, getting a message from your subconscious. They're just your brain being dumb. Like, it's the brain. It's really complicated. It does I don't understand. Let's not even try to interpret it with this sort of weird Let's just leave that to the neuroscientists, okay? Okay? Stop reading the weird books about dream interpretation. Okay? No. No, I don't think I will. 
I would certainly be fascinated by the thought of being able to record and play back my own dreams. No, that sounds terrifying. I'm sure most of my dreams are nightmares. And enjoy a second viewing of all those incredible fantasies in which I finally managed to track down a limited edition double patty Big Mac. But it also seems quite preposterous. OGBB, by the way, OGBB. Uh, but it also seems quite preposterous and unworkable in so many ways. Or does it? Uh, scientists from all over the world have been working on the concept of recording dreams for decades, and some suggest that we're moving ever closer to the day when dream TV becomes a reality. I don't know why I've started speaking like a, a, a boring lecturer. <laughs> it's like. I, had a, I swear I had a teacher, or maybe it was, I can't remember who it was, but who spoke like this. Scientists from all over the world have been working on the concept of recording dreams for decades, and some suggest that we're moving ever closer to the day when Dream TV becomes reality. Or is this just how people on the BBC speak? I think this is how newscasters speak, right? You know where it's like, I'm Simon Whistler, reporting from, I don't know why the first thing that comes into my mind is Hogwarts, but that's how my brain works. Reporting from Hogwarts, somewhere in the north, Good evening. <laughs> it's like, why the random pauses? Why are you randomly pausing in, like, inappropriate places? Scientists from all over the world. <laughs> Martin Dressler, a sleep scientist at the Max Planck Institute of Psychiatry in Germany, sounds quite optimistic. As he put it, the information that represents the dream is present somewhere in the brain, so in principle, there's no reason why it shouldn't be possible to access it. As recently as 2020, scientists in Japan announced the invention of the dream recording machine, which they claim is a major breakthrough in playing back last night's dream on your TV screen. The basic concept behind the machine makes some sort of sense whenever we're mentally... When Whenever we mentally visualize a particular object, our brains generate a consistent neural pattern which is unique to that object and visualization. Yeah, probably this is a f***ing lot of objects, aren't there? What are they going to put you in the machine and ask you to think of every object that you could possibly dream about? Because I'll tell you what, Desert Eagle is going to be really low down that list. <laughs> The dream recording machine uses a learning algorithm which analyzes the unique neural patterns getting fired out by your brain as you sleep and then adapts them into a visual interpretation for you to enjoy the following morning. It sounds quite awesome in principle, let me guess it doesn't work at all. <laughs> And maybe a few in a few hundred years from now, we'll look back at this as a, as a significant first step in the into the elusive lair of the Sandman. But at the moment, the technology is rudimentary at best when putting together your dream movie. All the machine actually does is broadly identify an object you were dreaming about, and then searches online to find the best matching image to slot into the film. So if you're dreaming about fronting a rock band to a cra packed crowd at Wembley Arena, what is this machine going to show? Like vague music. The dream machine might just throw up an image of Gary Glitter performing at the Piss and Shovel in Barnsley. <laughs> or, I mean, that would, I'd be quite impressed if it actually managed to do that, <laughs> but I don't think it's even going to be able to manage to do that. On top of this, tests have revealed that only 60% of the approximations of images uh, of the approximations of images are roughly on the light, right lines. That's 60% is not bad. So it sounds as if we've still got a long way to go, or maybe the whole thing is just a silly pipe dream. I can't help thinking that my own dreams would play back as largely incoherent and impenetrable mess, packed with a cast of constantly changing characters, much like a typical business play script. Perhaps most dreams are driven by emotion and instinct, an ever-fluctuating thought, which wouldn't necessarily translate very well to the purely visual medium yeah i mean look do you even if you have a vivid memory of your dream it, like you think about memories and stuff it's like yeah, yeah yeah i remember my journey to work but the reality is you remember the vaguest details of it and your brain like you think you're remembering like a whole big visual image but you're not and if you were asked actually if you were a if you were an extremely talented artist and you could draw anything like photorealistic and you just were like walking along the street and then they were like yeah draw the street you'd be like uh there was a street <laughs> wasn't there I don't even remember how wide the pavement was, let alone what the shots were. Why are we talking about this? <laughs> What's going on today? Great job. And bearing in mind how dreams can get frighteningly weird and freaky at times, the thought of having a dream recording stolen or leaked could get quite dangerous in the modern world, or you can get cancelled for a tweet you posted when you were about nine years old. Yes. It's like, f all that sh Probably best to leave private dreams to linger in the void instead of pursuing a whole new collection of potential nightmares. It's like, yeah, yeah, I had a dream last night of being a K in the KKK and being a huge racist and absolutely loving it. And then you get cancelled because you dreamed about being a racist. It's like, it wasn't a dream, it was a nightmare. I don't know why I dreamt I was in the KKK. I'm sorry. And then you have to go on an apology tour for dreaming you were about in the KKK. And it's like, oh, for f**k's sake. How dare you! But you know what? Good news, you're not gonna have to worry about people publishing your dreams on the internet, at least for a little while, hopefully not in my lifetime. <laughs>
I don't want that. You don't need that noise. But if you do want to put something amazing out onto the internet, then you do need to use today's glorious sponsor, Squarespace. Look, it's the summer. I don't know about whenever I go on holiday, it's like I, I'm a broken person. Because I'll be on holiday and I'll be like, ah, oh, relaxing. I love going in the nature, like in the forest, taking a hike, swimming in a river, that kind of shit. And I'll just be like, ooh, I've got a new idea for a channel or a business or a website or something. And I'm like, why am I so broken? But it is like you go on holiday and you do think about new things. You think about cool projects to start. And if you do want to start on those new projects, we'll just definitely do it with Squarespace. Look, you can do... There's a lot of stuff you could do with Squarespace. Like, you want to do a blog? I mean, I think that's like the big one, you know, like writing articles about something you're into online and sharing it with friends and family and hopefully a wider audience. And I mean, if it gets a lot of people visiting it, you could put adverts on it and stuff and even make money from it, which is glorious. Um, or maybe you're just into super dank memes. I think that's in the ad copy that we have here. It's like, maybe you want to make a website with the dankest of memes, yes? Uh, you could do that with Squarespace. Or if you want to start a shop, you can also do that with Squarespace. And what's fantastic is like, I am design incapable. Like my abilities at design are basically non-existent. And with Squarespace, you just go in and you're like, I like how that website looks, that template. You click on it and then you're like, okay, what color do you want this? What image do you want there? What text do you want there? Backed boy. And I'm like, I want it to say this. And you just click on it and it's done. And you have to type the text in, it doesn't read your mind. Maybe you should get working on that Squarespace, eh? Look, maybe Elon can help you out. Get that brain chip going. Squarespace and Neuralink should collaborate to make the website creation process even easier. But until we get there, Squarespace has made it as easy as possible with today's current technology. And it is incredible what you can make in a super short time with Squarespace. Then, uh, yeah, what else can you do? Oh, there's tons of other features. Email campaigns, patronage portals, social integrations, member-only areas, analytics, commercial options, 24-7 customer support. The 24-7 customer support is actually amazing. I remember trying it out when Squarespace, it was, this was like two years ago or whatever, when Squarespace first came on as a sponsor. And I was like, let's see how good this customer support is. So I like wrote them a message and I was like, hey, I really can't find this thing. And they're like, it's here. And I'm like, okay. Thanks. And it was like super fast and super good. And I'm like, I, knew, I just didn't want to trawl through all the help files. Thanks, Squarespace. Yeah. So uh, squarespace.com forward slash blaze to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Repeat CTA. Squarespace.com forward slash blaze to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. As I said at the beginning, thank you, Squarespace, for being a loyal sponsor. Always coming back to sponsor more blaze. Super appreciated. You legends. And you legends who are watching... Not that Squarespace, I know you watch these as well because you approve the ads, hello, but I mean the audience. Support the show, support Squarespace. It's a big, joyous, happy circle. Link below. Insect force fields, okay. Oh wait, something to keep insects out? That would be awesome, rather than those stupid grates that you have to use or like the things in the tent. Something that can actually just keep insects. I went camping like a year ago and I got eight ticks. You know, the little things that carry encephalitis and all that shit. And I just got home and I was like, I have eight ticks on my body. And I was like, next time I go camping, I'm going to take a tent because I just slept outside. <laughs> I was like, it's summer. It'll be fine. I just slept outside on the ground. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I got eight ticks. So I, uh, next time I took a tent, I got zero ticks. And in that year, I'd also got that uh, the, the vaccine. So you can't get that horrible brain disease that ticks can give you. It's up. After what felt like eight months of relentless Cornish winter, the sun has finally begun to peek out from the storm clouds and remind the population that there's more to life than just pelting rain and howling winds. And the arrival of summer has also reminded us that the world is full of terrible insects and small winged beasties which can get in our faces and bite our skin and poison our blood and generally make us look forward to next winter when all of these hideous creatures will finally perish and leave us alone again. It's like, oh, no bugs and it's like Danny and I are in Europe <laughs> and you go to like close to the equator it's like oh my god the bugs and there's bugs everywhere ah! or in Australia there are fucking massive bugs why Australia why are you so dangerous of course, some insects are vital for healthy ecosystems, and so we'd be in serious trouble if we just tried to exterminate them all. Yeah, 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 but let's give it a try, all right? I mean, DDT, let's bring that shit back. Let's get rid of the mosquitoes once and for all. But others completely ruin crops, spread disease, and have the capacity to transform a pleasant beer garden scene into a cacophony of chaotic cries of crazed consternation. Nailed it, Danny. All of those C's. And I just got that out one go, one try, because I'm a legend. Current bug repellents are either close to useless or wipe out all the good critters with the bad critters. No. 
What we really need is a clever portable insect force field, which we can set up quickly driving a, uh, quick, quickly during a camping trip or be used by a farmer to protect his vital crops. Such a force field could potentially keep out the insect riff-raff in desired areas without resorting to an all-out blanket massacre. Yeah, 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 but as I said earlier, have we tried the all-out blanket massacre properly yet? Seems like no, because there are still insects. <laughs> Why don't we just eat them all? I heard about, like, we should be eating insects for protein or something, because there's not enough protein. I'm like, yo, how about we try that when we've actually run out of protein? <laughs> like, why? Let's not get started too early, okay? Let's, while there are pigs, let's eat the pigs. And then we'll move on to, like, oh, it's like, oh, no, we run out of pigs. What are we going to eat now? Insects? No, 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 let's eat horses. And then it'll be like, what's, what's next? Well, I guess we gotta eat the dogs, because no one wants to eat insects. People are like, I love my dog. It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if it's like, do you wanna eat 17 grasshoppers or like a little bit of dog? Hmm? 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 Yeah? We're not saying your dog could be a neighbor's dog. Fuck! It could in theory evolve into one of the most important discoveries of modern times, finally putting an end to a long list of diseases and eliminating the need for pesticides or excessive protective plastic packaging. Certain insect repellents already claim to work like a force field as they provide you and your home with invisible protection, but this is largely just devious marketing that has resulted in some UK brands getting a bite on the shoulder from the Advertising Standards Authority. Because the truth is that an insect force field, or in fact any kind of force field at all, just doesn't simply fit anywhere in our current understanding of physics. Yes, yes, I feel like we'd heard if force fields were invented. They haven't been invented. So we're, we're used to seeing force fields in sci-fi films and TV shows that we rarely ever hear a plausible explanation for what they do or how they might work. It's just a magic invisible barrier which prevents solid matter and Captain Kirk from passing through to the other side. We get it. But in the real world, none of the four currently known forces of the universe, gravity, electromagnetism, and strong and weak nuclear forces, would allow for the creation of a true force field, as each force would throw a spanner into the works somewhere down the line. Very recent discoveries at Fermilab, the laboratory of the US Department of Energy, have shown that a subatomic particle called the muon could potentially reveal new evidence of an unknown fifth force. Ah, the force field force, finally! Uh, as it doesn't appear to be behaving in any way that fits in with our current laws of physics and is sensitive to something beyond the realms of our current understanding. Ah, it's the force field one. As soon as we discover that, I'd be like, yeah, yeah, it turns out that that last muon, whatever, that was the secret to force fields. Brilliant. No more doors, no more. We can finally solve the insect problem. <laughs> yes, Fermilab, you have rescued us from the mosquitoes. So there's still hope for the insect force field yet. We just need a bit more time to recognize that everything we thought about the universe was entirely wrong. Honey, we didn't shrink the kids because science. <laughs> yeah, there's so many problems with this. Like, people getting shrunk. It's like, yo, yo, yo. So if you shrink someone down, right? And it's like, so they're really, really small. Aren't they going to have a problem? Because, like, they're going to be breathing. And it's going to be like, well, the molecules are all a different size. Are they going to cross those membranes and stuff? Like, how's that going to work? Funnily enough, I'm, I'm reading a Michael Crichton book at the moment called Micro, which explores this very idea. And it's like, they're just like, yeah, yeah, yeah. How does the shrinking technology work? And the guy's like... I don't think the company that invented the shrinking technology even knows how it works. And they're like, cool, done, don't mention it again. And I'm like, all right, Michael. <laughs> yep, belief suspended. And I'll continue enjoying your book. Cinema audiences and readers have always enjoyed digesting incredible stories of shrinking humans from Alice Adventure, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland in 1865 through the classic 1966 film, The Fantastic Voyage, right up to the more recent Ant-Man movies. I've seen Alice in Wonderland, the cartoon version. Was it from Disney? I've not seen any of the others. Ha! Well, what a surprise! And yes, that includes I've seen Honey's I Shrunk the Kids, though. Too. I even think Simon might have watched that one. You're right, Danny. I really enjoyed Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. That was one of my favorite movies as a kid. Saw it many times, like a kid does. Like, they're just so happy watching the same shit over and over again that drives me insane. Like, oh my god. I've watched Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood with my kids so many times that I'm like, I, I'm like, I know all the characters. I know, I, like, you could be watching it and you can be like, I know what he's gonna say next. <laughs> Just, oh. <laughs> Why? <laughs> and our mind boggles at the amazing things we could do in real life if such a device as a shrink ray existed. For starters, we could. Actually, when you stop to think about it, there's not much use of a jet. Uh, there's not much genuine value we could do with a shrink ray. Danny, you joking? I'll shrink myself down and all the food would be massive. It's like, imagine just shrinking down and being like, yeah, you bought a tiny steak and you shrink down. It's like, oh my God, it's the size of me. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, actually, wait, that's not that useful, is it? It's really not that useful. 
<laughs> well, we'd be a lot less resource you greedy, like in that stupid movie with Matt Damon. Uh, what's it called? Where they shrink the people down because it's economically useful and then the movie becomes incredibly preachy about the environment and I fell asleep and then at some point they're in a vodka bottle in Sweden or some like that. I don't even look, it was I, I half remember it. It was really it was a great idea and I was really looking forward to seeing that movie and it turned out to be so shit. Sorry, that movie sucked. It's like I don't need to be preached about the environment. I was just hoping to watch a really good sci-fi movie while eating some popcorn out of a plastic bag that I'm not going to put in the recycling. <laughs> Because I'm a terrible person. How dare you! I suppose we'd at least save a fortune on the shipping of bulky items, and car parking might become a thing of the past if you could just shrink your vehicle and pop it in your pocket. That'd be awesome. And we, yeah, but then you get it out and it's like it's been shaking around. It's like all the airbags have gone off and shit. And you're like, ah, oh, for f sake! And they've it's been jangling against your keys, and you like make it massive, and it's like scratched the absolute. Sh out on and you're like ah oh, crap and we might have fun going around having people who get on our nerves without leaving much in the way of evidence in a, if anything the invention of a shrink ray sounds like an accident waiting to happen and i'm pretty sure it would be swiftly banned in at least 36 u.s states before it even made it onto the shelves of the local hardware store yeah but what about those other 14 states don't how many states there's 50 states right because there's that movie the 51st state so i'm pretty sure there's 50 of them what about the other 14 danny Mm. The most interesting thing about a potential salt shrink ray is that if we ever develop the technology to dramatically change the size of an object, this will also mean that we will be able to develop a growth ray, which does the exact opposite. This would be pretty crucial, as it could reverse potential accidents from the perilous shrink ray and get Grandma back to her usual size after little Tommy accidentally zabbed her over Christmas dinner. But it could also pretty much solve world hunger overnight. There would be no longer any need to try and get the right quantities of food into the right places that need it most. We'll just zap food and make it much bigger, so there's always enough for everyone. Everyone. And just imagine going into KFC to buy a bucket of fried chicken, which now has the potential to last all week and well beyond. Admittedly, there would be other dramatic consequences and side effects. The entire farming and food industry would inevitably collapse, as we would now need only one cow to make about a billion Big Macs. I also suspect that mankind would be hit by a new obesity crisis of a planet sinking proportion of planet sinking portion size. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then just shrink them. So it's like, let's say you like put on seven kilos or whatever. And it's like, well, let's just shrink you. If you were 70 kilograms, let's just shrink you by 10%. You're back to 70 kilograms. You're a little bit shorter. So you're just, but you, this wouldn't solve it at all, would it? No. <laughs> what are you talking about, Whistle? And that's not to mention the demise of the whole penis <laughs> enlargement industry. Because let's face it, we all know where most men are really going to be pointing those new growth rates. That's <laughs> 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 up. So maybe it's just as well that it would be completely impossible. The simple fact is we can't change the size of atoms. The distance between the protons and neutrons which make up the nucleus of an atom can't just be shrunk or grown at the atomic level. Yeah, no <laughs> Even if it somehow was magically possible, the shrunken object would then defy the laws of physics and become so absurdly dense that it would fall right through the planet. Holy shit. The only feasible way around it would be to somehow remove some of the atoms in the object or the person that you're trying to shrink. But if you're planning on shrinking a fully grown person into a quarter of an inch microman, you need to jettison about 24 million atoms for every single atom that you decide to keep. Wow, really? And by the time you're finished, there's probably not going to be much of a man left inside the miniature. The press headlines of 2018 appear to point towards the imminent arrival of a shrink ray, really, when researchers at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology revealed that they had figured out how to shrink an object to one thousandth of its original size. But in fact, this discovery of implosion fabrication is more of a highly specialized 3D printing technique which only works on structures made from an absorbent gel and helps designers to print tiny 3D objects by first creating larger scale models to work upon. So you didn't invent a shrink ray, you just made a model of some... <laughs> Oh dear. It's never going to, it's like, yeah, yeah, I invented a shrink ray. No, 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 you just, you just popped a balloon. It's like, it's different, isn't it? It's different. Like, it was stretched out, and now it's not. So that was a fucking lie. It's never going to be much use in shrinking or growing people or everyday non-absorbent gel objects. In truth, much like time travel, shrink or growth rays would probably create far more problems than they solve, and we're unlikely to see anything like this developed over the next few centuries or ever. Size matters, so we should, and we shouldn't be playing around too much with the matter of size. But a bob bob smell-o-vision. The school plague playgrounds of the UK. Oh my God, smell-o-vision. We had this like you'd be. You'd, there'd be a TV program, right, when I was a kid, and you'd have a scratch card, and there'd be like, scratch off section three, and you could smell like what they were smelling on the TV. It was such a gimmicky piece of sh no one liked it, and it always smelled weird. The school playgrounds of the UK are often full of kids exchanging collectible stickers in a bid to get rid of their duplicates and finally fill up the empty designated spaces in their albums at home. Yes, I remember this. Is this a thing elsewhere? Like, 
Often there'd be football players. And I remember having these as a kid because everyone else had them. And I was like, oh my God, I just don't care. Like, I, I liked filling in the sticker book, but it's like, who are these players? Why am I collecting them? I don't care. Football sucks. Uh, the sticker albums were always based around a particular theme, but the football stickers, yes, were the most popular by far. And ever since the 1970s, you can often hear the sounds of kids on break time rifling through each other's fistfuls of duplicate stickers while chanting, got, 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 need, oh my god, need! <laughs> yeah, this is true, we definitely did that. And you have these massive stacks of stickers. Even though I had zero interest in football, ah, oh, Danny and I, same pay. It's so unusual. Like, football is so ingrained, soccer, dear Americans, is so ingrained in the UK culture that to find another man who doesn't like football or be like, oh, did you see the game last night? Is like, I, I swear it's unusual. It's really unusual. <laughs> so good. Nice. Good. Even though I had zero interest in football, I always enjoyed the competitive excitement of trying to fill up my album before anyone else in my class. Oh yeah, you'd race to finish the album. Yeah, that's right. And whenever the new annual football stickers album came on sale, most of my spare pocket money went on buying new packs of six stickers and also Panzer Pop. Oh my god, blast from the past. But my own personal favorite collectible stickers were called Stinky Stickers. Each sticker was packed with tiny capsules containing scent oils, which were released when you scratched them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And curiously, while there were plenty of pleasant fragrances to collect, including stuff like popcorn and bubblegum and hot dogs, yeah, but it always smelled weird because it's like a fake... And I know I'm sure the flavor of, like, popcorn that you buy in a black bag already is, is artificial. It's made with, like, E number... 718, E number 312, E number 7721. But it's like, okay. Okay, it's weird though. It's still weird when you scratch it off and it smells like popcorn and you're like, oh, I'm hungry. But I shouldn't be because it's just a weird chemical tickling my brain. What the f*** is wrong with me? Uh, including stuff like popcorn, bubblegum and hot dogs. There are also some proper potent pongs in the collection, including old boots, rotten eggs, and overexcitable skunk. After I proudly filled up my stinky stickers collector's album and sh uh, showed it to my bewildered dad, I can remember him saying that we're probably not too far away from a time when all films and TV shows will be presented in thrilling new smell vision <laughs> But in a way, smell vision has already been around for decades, just not in a way that, that d generated the slightest sweet whiff of success. One of the most notable attempts to get smell vision into cinemas was a technique created by Swiss professor Hans Laub, which was used for the 1960 film Scent of Mystery. The compelling tagline for the movie was, first they moved in 1893, then they talked in 1927, now they smell in 1960. Yes, this was the, the, the innovation that everyone needed, wasn't it? Hans. It was quite a complicated setup called The Smell Brain, which surprisingly didn't involve any manual input from the projectionist. As the film threaded through the projector, markers on the film would automatically pierce membranes within a network of pipes hidden underneath the audience seating, which was then wafted around by fans. The viewers would be treated to a relevant scent, such as grapes or flowers or fresh sea air, when the film's markers triggered the release at the right spot. I have to say, it's quite cool technology for the 1960s though, isn't it? <laughs> Is that a fart? What I really like about the concept is that unlike more recent attempts at theme park 4D cinemas in which viewers occasionally are sprinkled with water or experience a vibration in the chairs during a 10 minute film, this wasn't just a novelty gimmick. The smells were woven into the fabric of the plot and provided enhanced clues which weren't visible on the screen. I think I saw, it was a few years ago, like it's not when I was a kid, it's like in recent years. I went to the movies and it was like a 12D thing or whatever and it had all, it had smell, it had everything. And I was, I think I was seeing Spider-Man or whatever. And it just kept, I just kept having air blown in my ears. And the, like, I guess it was supposed to be at the right time. And the person comes in, like they pause the film about half an hour in. They're like, we're really sorry. The air thing wasn't working. So we'll reset it and get it going again. And I'm like, okay, fine. And then they start the whole movie again. So I just have to sit there and watch the first half an hour of Spider-Man again. And I'm like, why? Just starting from 30 minutes. I didn't miss that much. <laughs> why do I have to sit and watch this again? I just watched this. To live life. You need problems. That's so stupid! The smells were even into the fabric of the plot and it provided enhanced clues uh, which weren't visible on screen. So, for example, even though you couldn't always see certain characters in a particular scene, you could smell the lingering presence in the shadows by the distinctive smell of perfume or pipe tobacco. I love that idea. Sadly, the film was only ever shown in three special cinemas in New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago, and it cost up to a million dollars to install the smell braid system into each cinema. Holy sh million dollars in 1960? That is a lot more than a million dollars today. 
Uh, early showings of the movie were plagued by technical issues resulting in delayed smells or no smells at all, which often meant that the soundtrack was drowned out by the noise of loud and desperate sniffing of the audience. The scent of mystery turned out to be a box office stink bomb, but a bomb bomb Director Cat Jack Cardiff later described it as the one film I want to erase from my memory. The reason for that is, through no fault of my own, the film was a complete disaster. Through no fault of it, did you have to just slip that in there, Jack? It's okay. You, I mean, you're partly responsible, aren't you? Later attempts to revive the format in the 1980s were far more simplified affairs in which audience members were just given scratch and sniff cards to encourage uh, and encouraged to scratch each section when the relevant number flashed on the screen. Yeah, this is what I remember from TV when I was a kid. But true smell of vision may be some way off yet, as it's incredibly difficult to synchronize a smell which will be experienced by everyone in the way that it was intended. It's no secret that the porn industry will pay top dollar to the inventor who comes up with a willing formula. Oh god, what are we wanting to smell in porn? Oh. Smell like bitch in here! Oh, y'all smell like this to me! No doubt because they're keen for a background smell of baking and fresh flowers to elevate their moving pictures to the next level. Yeah, that's what they're looking for. Oh, porn. The innovators. And there are ongoing attempts to bring digital smell of vision into your home, including a 2013 attempt from Tokyo University of Agriculture and Technology, who claimed to have invented a smelling screen containing gel pellets which are vaporized into air streams across the display screen and then wafted to the relevant spots of each picture by fans. This is so... just stop it. No one wants this. It's like, yeah, yeah, what movie are we going to see? Uh, like, Slumdog Millionaire. It's like, it's just going to be smelling slums. I've never actually seen Slumdog Millionaire. It's about... is it about slums? I, it's about some kid. From a slum, he goes on, who wants to be a millionaire, right? Right? Are we going to be smelling slums? Because I don't want to smell slums. But the truth is that there's only limited potential for smell vision in films and TV anyways. You don't necessarily want to be absorbing the full, authentic aroma of a film set in the olden days when the whole world stank like a toilet. Perhaps smell vision is more likely to be embraced by corporate marketing. How much more effective would it be if those adverts for KFC or Starbucks or Krispy Kreme could actually waft their alluring scents into your living room? Yeah, but I'd be like, I know it's fake. So it's kind of weird. And then next time I eat it, I'll just be thinking of that fake smell rather than the delicious taste of KFC. The British Broadcasting Corporation, Danny, just say the BBC. <laughs> Why do you have to make it difficult for me? My, so everyone knows what BBC stands for. Big Black. <laughs> Might have been on the right track all the way along in 1965 when they released that all you need, when, you re when they realized that all you need is the power of suggestion. As part of an April Fool's prank, they screened an interview with a professor who claimed to be able to transmit smells through cathode ray tubes and demonstrated this by brewing coffee and slicing onions while encouraging viewers to stand six feet away from their TV sets and take a good sniff. Even though it was obviously just a gag, the BBC received an avalanche of mail from incredulous viewers who were amazed at how this worked, including a couple of of complaints from people who claimed that the smell of the onions had made their eyes water. Maybe there's no point in bothering to come up with new real inventions that actually work. All this effort is clearly wasted on us. smell vision is not something we need or want or should be... Focus on what was that thing we wanted, Elon Musk? The brain chip! Get on the brain chip! I want my 37% memory improving, clearly, because it's a mess. God damn. This has been an episode of Business Blaze, brought to you by the legends over at Squarespace. Yes, that's where you should go. There's a link below. And thank you for watching. This felt long, didn't it? Stop reading the weird books about dream interpretation, okay? No. No, I don't think I will.